If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money That's what's at stake here with, with McCutcheon. Uh, McCutcheon is really about the corruption of our democracy and how much we feel that we really have a voice, that it's a real, open, fair, democratic process where everyone can have some impact. Uh, it, it's about enabling a very small fraction of the wealthiest people in our country to have this supersized influence on the political process. Um, a small group that feels entitled, really, to be able to have as much influence as their money can buy. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Part of the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to establish a true democracy and to create a just society. I'm your host, David Delk. In January 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court issued their infamous Citizens United versus FEC decision. That decision continued to build on past decisions which declared corporations are people with constitutional rights, and that money is speech. The Supreme Court is now set to continue its attack on congressionally enacted limitations on big special interest money elections by the wealthy and corporations. Indeed, to continue what the Alliance for Democracy perceives as its attack on democracy itself. With us today is Kate Titus. Kate is the Executive Director of Oregon Common Cause. So welcome to the program, Kate. Thank you, David. Good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, tell us a little bit about the founding and purpose of Common Cause. Okay. Well, Common Cause is dedicated to reforming government, strengthening democracy. It's about people taking matters into our own hands. It's an organization that was founded 40 years ago now, 1970, uh, as a way for people to get involved in the political process and have an organized voice. Uh, it was initially founded by a fellow named John Gardner, an interesting person. He was a Republican in a Democratic presidential ca cabinet. He served as the Secretary of Health and Welfare and Education in Lyndon Johnson's sec cabinet. And in coming to Washington and seeing from the inside what was going on there, he was really appalled at the amount of influence that special interest uh, and large, wealthy corporate uh, interests had in our political process. He said, everyone's organized but the people. That's mm -hmm. the, a quote that's been handed down. And it was that that motivated him to start Common Cause. There have been many involved in Common Cause. John Gardner has since passed away. And in fact, our the cover, current chair of our board, our national board, is Robert Reich, the noted uh, economist and also a former cabinet member in a president's cabinet in, in uh, Ca Carter's uh, no, not Carter, Clinton's, uh, Clinton's cabinet. <laughs> he was the uh, Secretary of Labor. Right. <clears throat> but really who leads Common Cause are ordinary people. And it is as strong and as effective as we make it as a voice for our own organized involvement. Mm -hmm. Right. And so do, do you think that if, if uh, John Gardner were alive today and he were looking, he were going to Washington, D.C. now and looking around, do you think that he would see any improvements in what he perceived as the problem then? Well, I think there have been remarkable improvements, many of which Common Cause was in the lead of over the last four decades. Uh, Common Cause helped to broaden the enfranchisement and involvement of people in the political process, led the fight to pass the 26th Constitutional Amendment that lowered the a voting age to 18, in in involving young people with the right to vote. Uh, passed state sunshine laws that opened up the democratic process uh, meetings, public meeting laws, meeting records open to the public now, uh, has really been in the forefront of the efforts to reform the influence of money in the political process, setting in place uh, a host of campaign finance laws that we've been governed under for the past four decades, really took things in hand after the, the era of corruption, the Watergate scandals that time. and. Uh, certainly did not end greed and corruption, those are never ending battles, mm -hmm. but did uh, make a big difference and kept things in check for quite a uh, long time. But we're at a historic moment and um, 
in the process of losing all of that. So I think John right. Gardner would be a little taken aback and, uh -huh. and ready for a renewed effort. Right, yeah. So uh, a major step back, of course, was the Supreme Court Citizens United decision. Yes. So talk about that decision. What, what did that decision do? Yes, and, and the, the current efforts that are happening now are really seen as a sequel to Citizens United. That was a, a monumental Supreme Court case, uh, though not the general public doesn't necessarily follow Supreme Court decisions. Many people are aware of it because it has had such an impact mm -hmm. on our political process. Uh, 2010 decision, the Supreme Court looked at uh, campaign money in, in politics and really started to begin the unraveling, uh, maybe not totally begin, but in, in a more serious way, uh, started unraveling the campaign finance laws that we've had in place. And I think there were two important things from that decision that are worth noting. Uh, one is opening up the ability of corporate treasuries to, to, to donate into political campaigns. So corporate money coming directly from corporate tre treasuries. Right. and. Uh, really reinforcing this erroneous idea that corporations are people. Uh, the other piece is making a distinction between what is known as independent expenditures, money spent independent of the candidates and the political parties themselves, uh, from money contributed directly to candidates and parties. And the distinction that was made is that, yes, if you donate money directly to a candidate or to the political party, maybe that could be seen as having some corrupting influence. There's a quid pro quo, an expectation that they owe you something. But money that's spent separately uh, on your, and it has no coordination with that campaign, should just be seen as an individual's free speech and needs to be protected. Which in theory might make sense at, at the surface, but if you actually look at it more deeply, you realize, one, it's it's absurd to think that there isn't a degree of coordination and, and that candidates don't know where all this money is coming. Uh, in, in actual fact, most of these independent uh, PACs, super PACs that we hear about, hire the former staffers of the candidates and, and mm -hmm. th there's quite a bit of understanding of what the shared goals are. Uh, and so to say that when the Koch brothers or Sheldon Adelson um, or, or any other major uh, spender puts a, a lot of money independently into an election, it doesn't have any influence on the campaign or candidate, I, I think is... Uh, yeah, it's pushing It's ridiculous. Uh, right, yeah, it's pushing the boundaries of reality, certainly, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the Supreme Court has heard arguments in a new case that uh, many people are uh, very alarmed about, and that's yeah. the McCutcheon versus the FEC case. Tell us a little bit about that case. Yes, all eyes are on the McCutcheon case. Mm -hmm. Well, McCutcheon versus FEC is a case pending before the Supreme Court right now that will really determine the fate of our ability to regulate money in politics. It is somewhat of a sequel to Citizens United that has started to erode current campaign finance law as we know it. Uh, what McCutcheon does is it looks specifically at campaign contributions and con contribution limits, the limits that we set on any one individual or entity contributing to a political campaign in a given election cycle. And even more specifically, it really looks at aggregate limits, the total amount of money that any one individual can give to multiple campaigns in a given election cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and I would say, <clears throat> for people who are wondering, McCutcheon versus FEC, what is that? Sean McCutcheon is a uh, businessman from Alabama. He's a political donor, and he has teamed up with the RNC, the Republican National Committee, as the plaintiffs in this case. So McCutcheon and the RNC have um, taken this challenge to the Supreme Court, and they're challenging aggregate contribution limits. Okay, and, and aggregate contribution limits, again, are or the amount that, say I had a lot of money that I wanted to spread around, that's the total amount that I could spread among all candidates. And we're talking about money which is given directly to the candidates, not to so-called independent campaigns. That's right, right. Okay. That's, that's right. Okay. And 
there really there is a distinction between the aggregate limits and the contribution limits, but I think one thing that's important to recognize is if the courts decide in the McCutcheon versus FEC case to strike down aggregate limits, really it's going to make all contribution limits meaningless. Um, and, and that's because of the way that fundraising happens in the political world at this time. It, the, um, the, if, if a, the, the plaintiffs in this case, McCutcheon and the RNC, are saying that they're only actually challenging aggregate limits and not um, individual limits on any given campaign. But they know that that distinction won't actually matter in practice because the way that ca candidates and campaigns fundraise now is much more often jointly. And, and how it works, you've got uh, two or more campaign committees that join together and form a joint fundraising committee. Now each of those committees separately may have a limit and it depends on the year and what the FEC s sets, but let's say an individual can't give more than $5,000 to any federal campaign in a given election cycle. So you've got an individual limit of $5,000. But two or more groups, and it's usually dozens of groups, uh, will join together, form a joint fundraising campaign, and that allows them to ask for and receive donations in the amount of the total limit the aggregate limit of all of those involved. Mm -hmm. So if you had 10 groups involved in a joint fundraising committee and the, the individual limit was 5000 that year, that joint fundraising committee could actually ask for and receive donations in the size of $50,000. Mm. Um, and often it's more than that. So what you've created then is the ability of uh, candidates to go out and ask for much larger amounts of money, donors to give much larger amounts of money with the expect expectation that they're going to be noticed, they're, it's going to buy some influence. Uh, in the, the theory is that that money is then distributed equally to, to the partners up to their limits. Mm -hmm. But in actual practice, there, there are no limits on how that transfer happens, and so usually the money is divided up on how it's raised. Um, if, if someone raises the 50000 they get the 50000 uh, it could be distributed in all sorts of ways, uh, but what it ultimately does is just allows for much larger transactions than you would be able to get away with with individual limits. Okay, yeah. I was concerned that, like the Citizens United case, which was the, the Citizens United uh, case itself was a pretty narrow uh, question, and the Supreme Court really expanded it uh, in, their, in their decision. I was really concerned that McCutcheonson you when the Supreme Court issues their decision would do the same thing, so go beyond the narrow question that was being asked and and uh, throw out all limitations. But what you're suggesting is that even if the Supreme Court doesn't do that, that will be the that will be the the actual effect of it. That's right. I mean, one of the things that happens when you open up something for interpretation, it, it the the court you don't know for sure how the court is going to define it and what they will rule on. But even if they rule very narrowly and they strike down aggregate contribution limits, it, it will have, in fact, the effect of making individual limits uh, meaningless. And so that tool that's been critical in upholding a democratic process for decades will be lost. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Do you know who, um, uh, who has joined with the Republicans in arguing? Um, before the Supreme Court or in, in support of them? No, I don't, and, yeah, and that no, would be, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the, there are uh, a number of organizations and entities that are following this case very closely because, of course, it's going to be, have major implications, and so for people who are interested to learn uh, more details than you or I maybe uh, have, um, websites to go to, Common Causes National website, uh, the Brennan Center, uh, there's a number of others, um, Democracy 21, mm -hmm. but you could just Google uh, McCutcheon versus FEC yeah. and wade through that information yourself. And right, okay. And, and uh, do, do we have an idea when the Supreme Court will be issuing a decision? What I've heard is the expectation is somewhere around February, but of course it's not, there's not a set date yet, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, whatever they decide could most definitely affect the elections of next year. 
yeah. you, the, even the primary elections. Absolutely. Right. And what, what many people know is that the Citizens United decision had an enormous effect. Uh, it unleashed a flood of this independent expenditure money and corporate money, uh, expanding the amount of money, making the 2012 election the by far the most expensive election in history. Uh, if this happens, you know, it's, it's going to start to change everything mm -hmm. much more dramatically. Mm -hmm. than okay, yeah. So when I feel as an ordinary, pr pretty ordinary <laughs> citizen uh, who does like to get involved with, you know, yeah. some of these questions, uh, that my voice is not really heard presently, uh, that is certainly going to, uh, that feeling is even going to be more prominent in, in the future. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, that's what's at stake here with, with McCutcheon. Uh, McCutcheon is really about the corruption of our democracy and how much we feel that we really have a voice, that it's a real, open, fair, democratic process where everyone can have some impact. Uh, it, it's about enabling a very small fraction of the wealthiest people in our country to have this supersized influence on the political process. Um, a small group that feels entitled, really, to be able to have as much influence as their money can buy. Um, the idea that money is speech and mm -hmm. that should not be restricted, even if it's uh, drowning out the voices of, of everyone else to have a relatively fair democratic process. Okay. And, and what, what do we do? I mean, it seems, it seems so hopeless. It seems like uh, the more these decisions come down from the Supreme Court, the more money there is in the process, the less voice I have, but yet yeah. I don't want that to happen. Yeah. You know, clearly the system is broken and needs to change, and I think it can feel very overwhelming. It's, it's an epic battle of greed and corruption. This is not something that you ever win once and for all, that we can finally put this to rest and say, now we've fixed everything. And so it can feel... Like, why bother? If, um, but I would say that's the argument of why you, can, you, you must always bother to keep it in check. But things can be done. Uh, Common Cause is working on three fronts, uh, a short term, medium term, and long term mm -hmm. of some things that we can, we can do uh, that are within our power as a public and can do right now. Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to improve disclosure laws. You've got, especially with Citizens United and the independent expenditure money, uh, there was the, the understanding that uh, you would not limit money going independent from the campaigns, uh, but it should be fully disclosed. But in actual practice, we know that that's far from the case, and uh, donors play these shell games. And, and we, the public, the voting public, really don't know where this money is coming for, from in large part. So yeah. disclo better disclosure yeah. laws, I and, would say. And the Supreme Court, actually, in the Citizens United case, uh, said that that was what we needed to do, was to disclose. And yet Congress failed to do that. That's and right. it's not happening at the local level either. That's right. In general. Yep. Right. Okay. I, I yeah. Know. Right. So, so that's, a, that's one yeah, immediate right. thing that uh, that's probably the easiest thing that could happen soonest. Uh, but, I, but it's not enough in it of itself. I think we also need to pass at state and federal levels uh, systems of small donor public financing of elections. Uh, change the system so that money, this, this great degree of money in, is not needed in the political process, that candidates can run effectively uh, based on small donors and, and put their attention to the general public uh, rather than f having to focus day in and day out on raising money from a small group of wealthy elite. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that public financing of elections works. Uh, there in other parts of the country, Maine, uh, we've seen it in Arizona, Colorado. We even saw it here in Portland for a while, mm -hmm. um, although it got sunsetted out. And I think there wasn't enough information out there that people understood mm -hmm. in time what they might be losing, and so uh, yeah, we don't have right. it at the moment. But small donor-funded uh, elections uh, makes a big difference. But I think long-term, the, the, the thing that really needs to happen is we need to pass a constitutional amendment. Uh, we need to set constitutionally uh, that the 
our ability as a, as a democratic public to regulate money in politics is not left to judicial interpretation. That we make clear that money is not speech and that corporations are not people. Mm -hmm. And as you know, because you've mm -hmm. also yeah. been very involved in this work, there's some great strides moving. Passing a constitutional amendment is not something that can happen overnight. It's uh, uh, a big task, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And uh, we're slowly, in a very organized fashion, with people all over the uh, country, building that ground up support uh, to make that happen. Here in Oregon, we've passed local resolutions, both by the ballot and in city councils, in 15 communities across Oregon, calling for this constitutional amendment that clarifies that money is not speech, corporations are not people. It's passed everywhere as far east as Baker City, as far west as, uh, I mean, as, as, yeah, as Coos Bay and um, uh, oh, Lincoln County. Lincoln County. Uh -huh as far south as Ashland, as far north as Portland, uh, small towns, big towns. And then this spring at the state legislature, a popular movement organized, uh, got the state legislature to also pass a statewide uh, initiative calling on Congress to pass a constitutional amendment as well. That's just here in Oregon, multiplied by that happening all around the country where there's been at least 500 small local resolutions similarly in, in small communities around the country and 16 other states have gone on record in one way or the other and Oregon makes 17 we were actually the 16th but uh, 17 states have gone on record calling for a constitutional amendment so the groundswell is beginning to rise, but it's going to take a lot more work and it's going to take more people getting involved. Right, and, and you said that in Oregon, it was an initiative. Actually, it was, it was a, it was yes, actually thank legislative. You. That's, that's uh, correct. Thank uh, you. It, it passed to the legislature rather than through the initiative. And I know that some people have suggested that we need to do this also as an initiative in Oregon. Have any comment on that? I, I, you know, here in Oregon, what you know, but the the listening audience may not be all informed of. Is there's a, a coalition of organizations, Oregon organizations with Alliance for Democracy um, in the lead and Common Cause, um, but Move to Amend and the Rural Organizing Project and uh, Main Street Alliance, a number of organizations all working together, um, strategically providing some leadership for how to move this here in Oregon. And one of the, one of the strategies under investigation is whether a, an initiative to the ballot measure would be um, one way to move this forward, and I think if if that turns out to be a, a strategic path forward, I think um, the so we might be seeing that. Yeah, we might be seeing that okay. in the near future. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, talking about public public funding of elections, we had it here in Portland at one time. Uh, do you see uh, much um, momentum uh, to creating public funding? Uh, yes and no. Um, there's a real interest in public funding. People have seen it working uh, both here and in other places. Uh, there was a exploratory group that came together earlier in just this year to look at whether or not now would be the time to try to bring it back in Portland. And uh, that's still on hold, but there's definitely a feeling that it's needed. Um, there's also, there are people that are investigating whether or not it makes sense at the statewide level, uh, specifically for judicial candidates. Uh, people, I think, are becoming increasingly concerned that as more and more money floods at exponentially higher rates into our election system, that the, the influence on judicial races is particularly alarming. Uh, we, we may elect judges in some places, not everywhere, but we do at this time here in Oregon, but we don't really want our judges to be politicians. Right. We want them to be mm -hmm. accountable to the law, not sort of public opinion and um, special interests. And the fact that uh, a large moneyed interests can uh, sink money into what are relatively small races, judicial races that don't get a lot of attention, and overwhelm them with big money, as has happened in some notorious cases around the country, uh, I think is making people nervous. We don't. We have a, a, a um, 
state Supreme Court and a, a judicial system in Oregon that most people feel pretty good about, um, but they don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. So that's another place where there's there are folks exploring right. would public uh, financing, small donor public financed elections, be part of a solution. There are some limitations because of some of the court cases that have happened in the past that that make uh, that limit how much public financing can accomplish. But no one solution solves all of the problem anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. We need a, a full tool bag of uh -huh. things that can work right. complementary. Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, you've outlined some of those tools, and I appreciate it. And I really appreciate you being here, Kate. Thank, Thank you, you, David. All right. Appreciate Great. it. Good. So our guest today has been Kate Titus, Executive Director of Oregon Common Cause. To contact Oregon Common Cause, visit their website at commoncause.org slash OR or email at oregoninfo at commoncause.org. Or if you want to work with the Oregon Coalition to Restore Democracy, their website is www.oregonrestoresdemocracy.org or email, actually me, <laughs> at davidafd at email, excuse me, at ymail.com. Uh, don't forget you can watch Populous Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Populous Dialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when the new program is uploaded, you'll receive an automatic email notification. Populous Dialogues is now being seen in more places across the nation. In addition to our viewers here in Oregon, Cable access stations in Modesto and Sacramento, California are now able to watch each week. And they're joining folks in Spokane, Boston, Sheboygan, Urbana, Illinois, and elsewhere. So welcome to all those new viewers. You can help us expand our viewership even further. Contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Such suggestions are usually quite welcome. Populous Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. To learn more about us, visit our website at afd-pdx.org and learn more about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. So I want to thank our volunteers today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Because I never heard my money talk when a corporation has a colonoscopy then i'll believe they're human like me